just over a month ago, everybody was talking about making New Year's resolutions. I just don't get New Year's resolutions. Why is New Year a time for resolutions? The only difference is that you've just had some major parties for Christmas. And then they've done some fireworks on 31st of December. The next day has begun. It's still snowing. Or it's still cold. It's, not, it's nothing new. And you can have resolutions. What's changed? What's destabilized you? What retreat did you go into to now have a new resolution? The day is the same. It's still a holiday the first. You go back to work on the second or third or something. When some of the, when the highest number of diver, divorces are registered. What's so special? But if you do want a time for make resolu making resolutions, it's Ramadan and then after Ramadan. Why? Because there's so much that we do differently in Ramadan. الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى جل جلاله وعم نواله والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن صدق الله العظيم Our dear brothers and sisters absolutely uh, wonderful uh, to be here in your midst uh, never been to Hounslow before I've been on the underground Hounslow, Hounslow, Hounslow on I think the Piccadilly line or whatever it is never been to Hounslow before I've been to Hayes, I've been to Harrow but never to Hounslow and today I'm fortunate to be with you before this uh, Ramadan is coming up um, so Ramadan is, I'm assuming that this will not be the first or even the second or the third Ramadan for most of us. Is there anybody here for whom this will be their first or second Ramadan? MashaAllah, your first or second? Your first? MashaAllah, did you just convert to Islam or what? Wow, SubhanAllah. So you're going to learn from all of our experiences inshallah. so you're going to be really uh, better off inshallah. So it's not our first, for majority of us, it's not our first or second Ramadan. Uh, we're probably veterans in Ramadan for a lot of us. We've done it so many times. Right? We've done it so many times. Why do I mention that? The reason is that as we're uh, getting older and our birthdays are passing every year, right? we're actually getting closer to our death. And Ramadan is an absolute gift. Ramadan is the boost that we're, sub we're provided by Allah, a special sales you can call it, a special window of time where Allah is going to just magnify everything. It's amazing how much He magnifies, Cho totally changes the system. So for example, there's one hadith which is in Imam Bukhari mentions it and others uh, from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that as soon as Ramadan enters, so if this was Maghrib of the first night of Ramadan today, then what would have taken place? I mean, we're 40 days in advance, but if this was the day, then what Allah would have done is the doors of, the doors of paradise would have opened up. Especially for this month, the doors of paradise are opened up. The doors of hellfire are closed. Right? So, Futihat Abwabul Jannah. And the doors of hell are closed. And the shayateen are locked up. That's a massive change. Put the shaitan out of the way. Shaitan is one of our biggest misguiders. So Allah puts him out of the way. So there's a change taking place up in the heavens. We of course can't see this. We've been told about this. We can't see this. But I guarantee you, do you guys ever feel that the doors of paradise are open and doors of hellfire are closed and the shaitans are locked away? Don't you feel different in Ramadan? Haven't you felt different? You just feel a bit more easier to do good deeds, a bit easier to avoid bad deeds. And because the doors of paradise are open and Allah wants to shower, shower, shower with blessings, have you noticed that there's a lot of abundance in Ramadan, um, in everything, including food? You've seen the types of food that come out in Ramadan that don't come out throughout the year. And this is not a joke, but I mean, have you seen that? Where the, mashallah, our women and others get 
the ability to provide so much in iftar and people are feeding and the generosity and the blessing and the barakah and everything. Have you seen that? It's everywhere. There's such amount of sadaqat that people feel generous and people are giving huge amounts of sadaqah. Uh, a lot of people want to give their zakat during this time as well. And they contribute, they feed one another. There's dates being dis, uh, distributed, food being distributed, money being sent. Amazing blessing. There's something going on. So that's what the hadith says, that all of this change Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes. Then what he does, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does to incentivize it for us, he said, look, I'm going to take shaitan away from you as well. Now, if shaitan is away, a lot of people are going to say, but I still do sins in Ramadan. I still do certain sins. It's not like it just stops. It's not like I can just stop doing them. It definitely becomes easier, but it doesn't necessarily stop for everyone. So if shayateen are away, then why is it that we still can do sin? So I think there's a very simple answer to that. We have to understand sin. Sin is usually done for two reasons or through two promptings. <coughs> One is shaitan. الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي سُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ The one who whispers into the hearts of people. Uh, whispers into the chests of people. That's the shaitan. That's the whisperings. Uh, and there's another source of sin. Does anybody else, does anybody know what the other source of sin is? Why we sin? If I feel like doing a sin now, why would I sin? One is because shaitan prompted me. What's, whether that be a human shaitan or whether that be the unseen shaitan, the jinn. The second reason is the nafs. What do you mean the nafs? Why should the nafs prompt you to do, uh, to do a sin? The nafs, if you notice, you can figure this difference out. The nafs will only prompt you to do those sins which you are habituated to do. Because we've already made it a habit. That's why this Ramadan is coming, if you've not already recognized this. So Ramadan is coming. Anything that you still feel like doing which is wrong in Ramadan will most likely be something that we're used to doing already. And it's just a habit kicking in, addiction that we have to still want to smoke because you've got an addiction. It's that. You, people will say that they hardly ever feel like doing a new sin in Ramadan. A certain sin that they never used to commit. They never listen to music in their cars going to work in Ramadan. Hey, let me put some music on because it's Ramadan. They're not going to do that, are you? You will hardly do a new sin in Ramadan. You will hardly start and initiate a new sin in Ramadan unless you've got some really bad friends or bad company who want you. Otherwise, it's usually what we're struggling against in Ramadan is usually habits. A recurring habit. Somebody's uh, used to looking at something bad or is into something, uh, a bad relationship or whatever. Or like a smoking, you know. That's what's going to happen. That's one way to understand this. So now, the benefit of Ramadan, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that Shahrul Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, is the one in which the Qur'an was revealed. Qur'an is the words of Allah, so it was chosen. So was Ramadan chosen because it was a special month for the Qur'an to be revealed therein? Or did Ramadan, the month, become superior and great because the Qur'an was revealed in there? Either way you look at it, it's, it's all good. Because Ramadan includes many, many uh, different types of benefits, including the Laylatul Qadr. As Allah mentions, in the Anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. So, Ramadan was chosen especially for that. Allah says, I'm going to take shaitan away from you. So, I'm taking away one source of sin from you. One source of you doing wrong, I'm taking away. You don't have to worry about him anymore. Now, all you have to worry about is kicking your bad habits. That which you're used to doing, you can kick your bad habits. How does he do that? Multiple ways. Number one, shaitan is out of the way. But number two, the nafs, right? So he tells us that in Ramadan, what I want you to do. It could, Ramadan could have been like any other month. We could have just done tarawih extra. We could have... Because everything is expanded in Ramadan. You do nafil prayer, you do fard prayer, you do other good deeds, sadaqat, whatever. We could have just had that, there would have been no fasting. What is the purpose of fasting? Fasting, they say... Is a very different, it's one of the most different worships to all the other worships. Every other worship, you're doing something. Like in Salat, we're offering something, we're putting, doing some postures, including the sujood, which is one of the highest levels of expression of devotion that you can show. 
That's why the Prophet said that the closest a person can be to Allah is in his sujood. When we're doing anything else, giving sadaqah, we're doing something, we're commissioning something, we're actively doing something. Fasting is the one thing where we're not doing something, where it's about not doing something. Stay away from dawn to sunset from food, drink and sexual intercourse. So it's an inaction. And there's a huge benefit for the inaction. It's a sabr, it's a patience, it's a perseverance. And the highest reward in the mention in the Quran is for patience. And there's patience in multiple things, even coming for Fajr is a patience. Waking up for Fajr is a set, is a, is a type of patience. <clears throat> because it's a struggle. Patience is against any struggle. And now what happens is that it's Ramadan, the first day of Ramadan, right? You have a habit of having breakfast in the morning and then going to work. When it comes to around 10 o'clock, a lot of people want a coffee, a lift up, a tea or a coffee at that time. Anybody has a habit of coffee around 10 o'clock in the morning? A mid-morning coffee? Yeah. It looks like you're the only one who has everything here and nobody else. They, I don't know, man. But yeah, even myself, at half past 10, one of the students will make some coffee. It just helps. I don't drink coffee any other time. Now, if it's the first day of Ramadan, you're, because you're habituated to coffee at that time, you start feeling sleepy, droopy, lazy, ineffective, right? Less productive. I need that coffee, man. Especially if you've got a good coffee machine at work. There's one guy, he started going to the doctors because he had, uh, uh, he had some jittery feelings and all of that. And they're trying all test. And then, you know what? They just discovered that they bought a really nice coffee machine at work. Right, so he's just having too much coffee, so it makes you jittery sometimes, and too much caffeine, right? But anyway, the point is that, so I'm at work, and at 10 o'clock in the morning, or 10.30, I want that lift. I'll go to get a coffee, you can't have a coffee. You remember, you're fasting. But my nafs wants a coffee, I'm feeling lazy, I'm feeling sleepy. No man, you can't have a coffee. It's only your iman and your love for Allah, inshaAllah, that's going to keep you away from that coffee. So the first day your nafs ask, you say, no, you can't have it. It protests a bit, but I'm going to be tired. You can't have it. Second day, it protests again. And again, you're reminded. By the third day, you'll notice that you won't want it anymore. Third or fourth day, you won't need coffee anymore. Have you noticed that? You don't need it anymore. You don't need your lunch anymore. You get into that routine. It's very easy to train the nafs. You just have to push it. You have to refuse it. According to some studies, it shows that if you want to kick something, you have to refuse it seven times at least. Some have given the name, uh, given the number of days, 26 or 28 days. If you avoid something for 26 or 28 days, a number like that, inshallah, you should be able to kick it forever. And for many sins, it says that if you avoid the prompting of it, at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, then inshallah, that prompting will wither away. So what Allah is doing is Allah is saying uh, you are prohibited from eating halal food, drinking halal and halal uh, husband-wife relationship which are halal at other times during this time so that when your nafs wants them as you usually do want them you can't have them so you will train your nafs to, ref to, to listen to you and to accept your refusal in halal things these three are halal things so if, you, if we get our nafs used to, uh, to, to obey us, then inshallah they'll obey us in haram things which we shouldn't be doing anyway. That's I, that, I see that as a logic behind this and as a wisdom behind this. Okay, so where does taqwa come into it? Allah says that pre, uh, fasting was prescribed upon you. Kutiba uh, alaykum Fasting was prescribed upon you just like it was prescribed upon the people before you. So that you can gain taqwa. What's taqwa got to do with staying hungry, thirsty and so on? Well, taqwa means... I don't like to translate it as fear of God, though a lot of people do. Because fear, if you look at the definition of fear, fear means that when something happens to threaten you, you feel a sense of threat from something, which leads you to either fight or flee. Now, you can't do any of that from, with Allah. You can't fight with Allah and you can't flee from Allah because where are you going to go? You know, we had these little children, two-year-old child, one-year-old child. If the mother 
shouts at that child. Where does the child go? So you've got a two-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old, done something, and mom says, shout it, why do you do that for? Why do you break that for? Where does the child go? Back to the mother. <laughs> Goes back to the mother. Goes and hugs the mother. The mother is shouting at the child, and the child knows that their safety is in the mother. And uh, brothers, what about if the father sh- shouts at the child, where does the child go? The mother. <laughs> the mother. But usually go to the mother. Why? Because there's a sense of trust, safety, security, assurance. That's how our state should be with Allah. But that's why I don't like the word fear. God consciousness. It's probably better where you become conscious of Allah. That consciousness of Allah is what's supposed to... What, what exactly does that mean? That means God conscious means in a loving way that Allah has given us so much. Allah has done so much for us. We owe everything to Allah. He caused us to be created in this world. Otherwise, we'd be here. Yes, we came from our parents, but that whole system was placed. And then the other thing is that if you think about who you are, you didn't have to be here. I didn't have to be here. Allah chose us to be here and chose to bless us. And we in England, mashallah, in this great city of London, we've got nothing to complain about. Have you, uh, there's something to think about. Have you thought to yourself, that the lifestyle we have in this country is literally the lifestyle of the top 5 to 10% of the inhabitation of this world. If you compare ourselves to all the countries in the world and the populations of this world, we literally live a lifestyle of the top 5 to 10%. Allahu Akbar. Top in terms of our security, our safety, uh, medical, health-wise, Abundance of food, abundance of everything. Allah's placed us here. I'm not complaining. I'm thanking Allah. Because the more we thank, the better it will be. I'm thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this. But oh Allah, ya Allah, allow us to use this right. And don't allow us to use all of these resources that you have given us. Do not allow us to use it for your disobedience. Because it all comes with mischief sometimes. And may Allah protect us from mischief of the nafs. And Ramadan is the time that's coming up for that. So, Allah protect Allah saying, don't eat, don't drink, so that we can stop our... So, what exactly does taqwa mean then? Uh, the, the, the definition I like is, taqwa is that you're so much in love with Allah, that you never want to see Him unhappy with you, or frown upon you. You don't want Him to even frown upon you. You know, like if there's somebody you really respect, and you really value... Because they've done so much for you. Like you're generally, a, you know, and you are a, a person who uh, is grateful. You would never want to make that person unhappy. You, you would just try to avoid anything that would make that person unhappy. Or even question you. Or even frown upon you. And that's what it means. We get to that state. The only way you can get to that state is by understanding Allah and who He is. And He's got all the qualities there for us to love someone. When you love someone, you can only love them for good qualities that they have. But the reason why we cannot claim to love Allah more than anybody else is because we've not understood Allah as we should do. Otherwise, Allah in the Quran, He says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ The people who believe, they are most intense in their love for Allah. Uh, just we can just check what our love is most intense for by just seeing what would be willing to think about all day long and all night long what do we mostly think about that's that's the way to figure out what is our greatest focus what we're mostly conscious of if it's a businessman it's usually going to be how to uh, prosperity of business nothing wrong with business but there is that challenge as part of it isn't it uh, for a lot of people nowadays, their love is money. And according to one of the pious people of the uh, of a recent times, he said that it's such a good, such a ni'mah of Allah that we have Allah, that we have to come back to five times a day. Or those people who pray Jumu'ah, at least they come back to one time a week. That they remember, oh, there is Allah, that's my object of worship and devotion, not my money. Not the pursuit of just money, money. Nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with earning lots of money and having lots of money, but it just has an ability to distract. So it's a good job that we've got Allah to come back to today. We're sitting here after Isha in the masjid. 
Otherwise, we'd be worshippers of money because lots of people are worshippers of money today. That is the new God of the new century. Money's always been the case, but the way it's available now, the consumerism and the capitalism that is there right now is very different. Today, we have availability and access to foods, products that was only available for the royalty a hundred years ago. You have access to whatever you want today, alhamdulillah. So, that's God consciousness. And the way we attain it is that Allah gives us 30 days. 29 to 30 days. And that's enough time. That's enough time that by the end of Ramadan we've kicked our habits. Because shaitan is not there. He's not going to make us do any new sins. And all the old sins, we would have eventually gotten used to not having them. That's why just a month ago, just over a month ago, everybody was talking about making New Year's resolutions. I just don't get New Year's resolutions. Why is New Year a time for resolutions? The only difference is that you've just had some major parties for Christmas. And then they've done some fireworks on 31st of December. The next day has begun. It's still snowing or it's still cold. It's, not, it's nothing new. And you can have resolutions. What's changed? What's destabilized you? What retreat did you go into to now have a new resolution? The day is the same. It's still a holiday the first. You go back to work on the second or third or something when some of the, when the highest number of divorces are registered. What's so special? But if you do want a time for make resolu making resolutions, it's Ramadan and then after Ramadan. Why? Because there's so much that we do differently in Ramadan. They say, uh, some ulama have summed it up, they say that Ramadan is taqleelul ta'am, reducing your food. Taqleelul manam, reducing your sleep. And taqleelul ikhtilati ma'al awam, and reducing your interaction with just anybody and everybody. How? Well, taqleelul ta'am, you might be saying, no, I mean, I eat double at iftari time, so it's cool. I don't do any less food in Ramadan, but well, that's not what it was supposed to be. We're supposed to eat a measured amount of iftar. Just because you've not had lunch doesn't mean that you have lunch and supper together. Right? It's supposed to be regulated. That's the whole purpose of this. It's not just delaying the time of eating. So that's what it is. And why is it lessening the sleep? Lessening uh, the sleep is... Allah... Lessening the sleep is because you've got taraweeh prayers at night. Now that pushes on. That thing. I mean, nowadays, I don't know if it disturbs anybody's sleep at all, because we're, before in the earlier days, one of my teachers used to live in Africa. He was brought up in Africa, in one of the countries of Africa. And he's still pretty much a third world country. He says, after Maghrib, it was, we were so tired that we just wanted to go to sleep, but we couldn't because Isha, we had to wait an hour or half for Isha. We were sleeping. There was nothing to do after Isha. It was dark. You had to burn lamps. There was no entertainment, nothing. Nothing. Now, it's as bright as day. You can do whatever you want. You can see whatever show you want until all night. It's a whole different time we're living. The fitna is much greater. Somebody wanted to commit a haram, even a hundred years ago, they'd have to go out of their house and find somebody to commit haram with. Maybe one person, maximum two. Now in ten minutes you can, you can view a hundred haram, like real life stuff, in ten minutes. What a fitna that is. No way in history did they have this. No way in history they could have done as much in such a short time as we can do today. What a challenge that is. Allah make it easy. What a challenge that is. Just think of it. It's mind boggling that never in history of human history have they ever had this ability. Are we special? We've never had this ability to be able to commit so much in such a short time if, you, if somebody wants to. So Ramadan is the time. If you can pull it through, then that is what's made. Now, you know, I asked in the beginning that for how many people is it the first of Ramadan? Just one of our brothers it was first time for, right? For all of us, we're veterans in Ramadan. And this is what the issue is. Many of us... <coughs> have actually a routine in Ramadan that we started 20, 10 years ago, some of us 20 years ago, and we do the same thing every Ramadan. So you're saying, what's the problem with that? It's a different routine to the normal day, so what's wrong with that? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with it, is that I'm sure we, can we not do better than it? Is it that same thing that we were doing 10 years ago, the same 
type of fast, the same everything else, the same number of uh, uh, juz of the Quran or pages of Quran or dhikr or salat or sadaqah that we've been doing every year, we're doing the same every year, no difference. For example, in everything else of the world, we become better. We upgrade, we update. Have you noticed that? In everything else of the world, uh, for a lot of people, you know, when they just become, uh, they've left university or whatever, and they're going to get their first job, you need uh, to go for an interview, so a lot of people like to get a suit, right, a blazer and so on, right? So you go and get a blazer, you know, any blazer would work on that day. Do you worry whether it's a, a Giorgio Armani blazer or a Canali, or is it George or Primark blazer would work on that day. You just need a blazer to look, you know, formal and attired or whatever, and you just go, right? <clears throat> and then after that, as you move up in the world, a blazer from a lower shop does not work anymore. Then it needs to be hand-stitched. It needs to be designer because they'll come and check it. There's some industries, that I've been told by a friend of mine who works in a big banking corporation in New York, that they would actually come and, oh, that's a nice blazer, and they would actually come and check where it's from, and then they'd make fun of you if it's not from the right place. So, you move up in the world. When you first start going out to eat, you go to any place, and going out to eat, that's an outing in itself, and then after that, you become more discriminatory. Right? Then, it, then you become gourmet. Um, a lot of people, they buy no frill stuff. As they move up in the world, then they want the best of the stuff. You don't stay on Windows 3.1, do you? That's when we started using Windows, Windows 3.1, which a lot of the younger guys won't even remember. You have to upgrade, you have to update. Everything needs updates, so don't our ibadat need updating and upgrading to make them more powerful and intense and closer to Allah? So stop doing the same old no frills Ramadan for the veterans I'm talking about. For the veterans of Ramadan, do not do that same old shop brand, no frills package that you've had every year that you do. No, think how much I can do better this year. And what I've noticed is uh, two practical things. How to get the best out of Ramadan is that you start preparing in advance. So it's a good job we're doing this 40 days before. How do we prepare from 40 days before? Well, one thing that I found useful is try to get all of your major chores and projects out of the way from now. So think that what are these projects at work or in the house, certain jobs that need to be done, get them out of the way so that in Ramadan you can focus. I know people who work in mainstream, they try to take off Ramadan. Their holidays are Ramadan so they can actually take off and sit more in the masjid and do their work. If not, the whole of Ramadan they try to take off 10 days, last 10 days every year to do etikaf. You plan it. Don't be like those where Ramadan's coming, Ramadan's coming, Ramadan, and then suddenly you enter Ramadan and then it takes two, three days to adjust, to get into it. We've only lost two or three days. Why don't we want to lose it? Why can't we? We've got 27 days. Because Ramadan, as I said, Allah makes everything changed. Up in the heavens, doors of paradise are opened. Doors of hell are closed. If you want to go to hell in Ramadan, you'll have to break in. Like, it's not easy to go to hell in Ramadan. Because doors of uh, hellfire closed. What Allah does, He intense incentivizes. He says, every fard uh, worship you're going to do, which you're going to do like salat, fasting, I'm going to multiply it how many times? 70. 70 times. Not two times, buy one, get one free. Okay, it's a closing down sale, buy one, get two free. 70 times, that's just, nobody can give you that much. That's like, you can just take it for free, which it is for Allah, He's got abundance. Every fard worship we're going to have to do anyway as a, as a servant of Allah, mm -hmm. 70 times. And every other optional worship, the same as a normal fard worship in other times. Now listen to this. Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, if anybody misses a fast in Ramadan without any genuine excuse, for example, you had a football match on that day and he's like, man, I'm going to be tired. I, I, I'll, I'll just not, I won't break it. I just won't fast. I'll do it afterwards. I've got a major business meeting today. I'm going to have to take some corporate customers for lunch. And you, you know, you're not powerful enough or confident enough to say, no, I'm fasting, which is a, an aspect of pride nowadays. People respect these things. I'm fasting. You don't have to tell them it's religious fast because now 
Subhanallah, fasting is uh, a great lifestyle choice. You know, the five and two days up, fasting and five days eating, you know, for your health and so on is huge, uh, huge benefits for that. So, just the way you carry yourself. So he said, I'm not going to fast today, I'll fast later. The Prophet said that if anybody misses a fast in Ramadan, and then he tries to make up for it by fasting the entire year, or in another reading, the entire life, he cannot make up for the same reward that he's missed for this fast. Allah absolutely concentrates and intensifies and brings it all together every moment. Uh, ulama have said every moment of Ramadan is so valuable that you can't even count it compared to outside the month of Ramadan. So that's why any good deed you do is just multiplied, multiplied. So why would you want to waste that time for? By getting into Ramadan and then stabilizing yourself by the fifth or sixth day, you've already messed up three or five days. Just get into it, running. Right. Now, a um, few more points and then we'll open up for questions. So when you have Ramadan, uh, uh, we prepare for it, as I was saying. Get big things out of the way. Then after that, uh, write down what our usual Ramadan looks like. We know, we've been doing Ramadans all of our life, right? So what does a normal Ramadan look like? Okay, this is how much Quran I read, this is how much Sadaqah I give, this is how much this I do, etc, etc. So this year, I'm going to vow to do this much more. <clears throat> and when you plan for something, a lot of people go for Umrah. I've seen that the best Umrah or Hajj is the one where you've planned that how much you want to get accomplished aside from the basic acts of Umrah, what else you want to do. I want to do this much salawat, I want to do this many more tawafs. When you got that, you, this is how humans work. When you got goals and targets that I found very useful. In fact, I know of women, uh, you know, for women who cook, one of the most difficult things for them is not the cooking itself, but deciding what to cook. Do you know that? You know that, right? Uh, I can't see the sisters, but that's a very difficult thing. And uh, if you're people like me, if you're a person like me, I've only told my wife in the last 10 years or something, so I was going to only once what to cook. I'm like, cook anything as long as it's good. Like, <laughs> seriously, like, it could be dal, right? Completely, I don't mind. As long as it's made well, it's fine. I, I just can't think like what I want to cook, what, what I want. So if you're boring like me, then they have even more tough. So what they do is, before Ramadan, I would suggest for the women to make a schedule of the exact menu for every day. And because women also have to do worship. One of our scholars of the past, you just mentioned Sheikh Yusuf Mutala, our Sheikh, his Sheikh, Sheikh Zakaria, he used to tell his family, Rahimahullah, he used to tell his family, we just want you to cook a simple curry. We're going to buy the rotis from outside and we're going to buy the samosa from outside as well. You know, people like their fried stuff. We're going to buy that from outside. We're also going to buy the rotis and naans from outside. You just have to cook a simple curry so that you can also worship. They're all included. So, uh, I'm sorry if I'm messing it up for you guys. Right? But uh, that's what they used to do. Because they wanted everybody to maximize. Uh, this month of Ramadan because it's really valuable and we don't know how many more Ramadans we can these people today who just died in these last few days in Turkey I mean they would have been looking forward to Ramadan their Ramadan's gone whatever their last Ramadan was like may Allah bless them and elevate their status Amen. Right? Allah gives abundance in the month of Ramadan makes it very very easy so schedule it and I know these women what they do is they make their schedule uh, they make their menu then, you know, there's obviously preparation work that you have to do for a lot of the foods, cook some basic things. They do all of that before Ramadan. When Ramadan comes, they're very efficient in what they do. They know exactly what to do and, and, and so on. And mashallah, just be efficient. Whether that comes to your work, lifestyle or whatever the case is. Because in Ramadan, every night, there's people Allah writes as forgiven, emancipated from hellfire. Emancipated from hell. Utaqa min al nar. Ramadan is such an amazing... Have you noticed that... Uh, do, you, do, you get, does, do you guys get excited at iftari time? Okay, I've got a few more nods that are... That one, alhamdulillah. Because I was like, no, I thought it was going to be boring. Like, no, we don't, we're not excited at iftari time. Feeling shy, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 mashallah. I have to come here more often. We can have a relationship then. You can trust me, maybe, inshallah. Allah bless you all. Amen. So, the Prophet said, 
The fasting person has two excitements and two things that make him very happy. He gives us an example of one of them. He says, at his fitr, iftari time, when you can finally eat. I mean, there's not, no harm in saying, yes, I'm excited to eat. Uh, because in our sharia, if there's a guy who's like a macho man, he says, you know what? Everybody's doing iftar. I'm going to wait another half an hour. It's not allowed. That's bid'ah. That's wrong. That's not our fast. We do what Allah wants us to do. He says, eat at iftar time, eat. That's why there's a lot of people who say, you know what? I feel bad if I eat too much in uh, suhoor, so I'm not going to have suhoor. Who told you to eat so much? That's not sunnah. Just have a date and some water. That's suhoor. You get the reward for the suhoor, for the sari time. Right? Rather than missing it, you're missing the sunnah of suhoor. Have less. So that you don't feel like, don't have dal chawal. Don't have biryani. You know, like, don't have heavy foods at that time. It's about getting all of this right. So... Now, what we need to do is we need to identify where we are on the Iman scale. What is my Iman level before Ramadan? From 1 to 10. So if I say that I'm doing okay at 5, right? I'm at 5, I try my prayer, I try to do my prayers on time and everything, right? I'm at 5 out of 10. When I go into Ramadan, doesn't everybody's Iman increase a bit at least? It goes from 5 to 6, 7... It might go to 8, 9. Some people might get to 10, mashallah, if they're really careful and they sit for etikaf. And, you know, mashallah, these people have told me that. Now, in Ramadan, you've gone from a 5 to a 7, 8, 9 or 10. Most important thing, I don't know if I'm going to see you again to give you this message. But after Ramadan, shaitan comes back out. So what are you going to do then? Do we want to go back to a 5 after Ramadan? No, that's not the purpose of Ramadan. The purpose of Ramadan is to create taqwa and get closer to Allah. So that from the five, if we're going to come back down from anything, if we got to a seven or eight, we don't want to come back to a five. Worst case scenario, at least a six. So that we're better off next year than we are this previous year. Then the year after, we're even better and better and better and better. At least a 5.5, if not five. Right? Now, I'll tell you a trick of shaitan. There's two times you have to be very careful of shaitan. One is just before Ramadan. And one is straight after Ramadan on the day of Eid. What do you mean? Just before Ramadan, shaitan will find an excuse to get you involved in something that's going to waste your time so that you spend the first few days at least messing. He knows it's going away. So he's going to leave a fitna. And one of the fitnas that he leaves is which day did Ramadan begin? So you start arguing with somebody else. And stuff like that. But the worst one is after Ramadan. MashaAllah, you've done very, very well for the whole of Ramadan. You've avoided so many sins and you've done good deeds and everything. And you're feeling really good. So many people have said that on the day of Eid, it was afternoon or evening time. I was alone and I couldn't help it. I committed the sin that I just avoided. Shaitan comes back out with a vengeance. And he tries to make you delete everything you've done. Be careful. I said, I'm not going to see you. I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to see you again before the end of Ramadan. But this is something that I'm telling you from a lot of people's experience. Maintain what you have for after Ramadan. You don't want to go back to a five. You want to stay higher. MashaAllah, there's one person. He's told me that there's this one Ramadan. He tried his best. He did a lot of dua. He was really on the ball. He did etikaf that year. And he said, you know what the benefit was? I developed an immunity from a sin that I could not avoid before. So even after Ramadan, I didn't feel like doing the sin. One month, two months, three months, five months. It's like, you know, when you don't even feel like it. You know, those uh, uh, Muslims don't drink. So when we go into a supermarket and you like shopping, you like to check all the aisles out. When you get to those two, three aisles that have wine and beer, we just miss them out. Alhamdulillah, we're not wasting money here. We don't even have to bother with that. Now that's because there's no window open in our heart for, for that. Just like human beings, you know, for their mother or sister, there's no sexual window open. It makes no difference regardless of how attractive they are. Because that's just closed. That's immunity. One is that, hey, you feel like it, but you're stopping yourself. The other one is, I don't even feel like it right now. That's what we want. You know, on a good day, if you're a healthy person, even if it's uh, about 10 degrees, you're not going to feel cold. 10 degrees is okay. I remember once I came back from another hot country and I had a bit of a flu or a cold. 
and everybody's cool and I'm wanting to wear a jacket. Why? Because my immunity is low. Likewise, we want to create immunity from sin by efforts in Ramadan and they'll pay off. So this guy said, I managed to stay seven months after Ramadan without even thinking of that sin. Then at the end of the seven months, I started getting weak. And I started faltering. Then I don't know, he probably messed up, I don't know. But then he said, another year after that, I think a year or two later, he said, I, mashallah, I summoned up my courage and I did a lot of good deeds again. And a lot of dua to Allah, did it thicker. And he said, that year I also went for hajj. Two and a half months later, I went for hajj. He said, this year, mashallah, my immunity lasted for nine months of that year where I didn't commit that sin. And then he said, I started getting weak. That immunity had worn off. I started feeling like I wanted to sin. I was like, no, man, I can't do this. And he says that what helped me was that there was two months left for Ramadan. And I thought to myself, if I can pull it through the next two months and get into the safe sanctuary of Ramadan, I've saved myself. And he managed to do that. He said, this was the first year in many years of my life that I was free of that sin for a whole year. That's what Ramadan, that's how powerful Ramadan is. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. We ask Allah to give us the babu rayyan, a special door for those people who fast. And we ask that Allah allow us to upgrade our fasting and our Ramadan and our worship and everything this year. Allow us to be organized and allow us to be closer. Allow us to be closer to him. Ya Allah, grant us your love. Grant us understanding of you. Grant us your recognition and allow us to be closer and make it easy for us. And allow our surrounding to be conducive for that. Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind, you can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.